looking at the Galatians chapter 2 this morning. So as you're turning there, if you don't have a Bible, uh, please raise your hand and we'll get you one. We're going to be in Galatians 2, the first 10 verses this morning. Um, for those of you who don't, I'll just introduce myself real quickly. I'm a dentist. My wife used to be a manicurist. She had to quit because we fought tooth and nail. I have, uh, <laughs> we're doing a lot better now. We, um, hey, you know what? This is going to be more fun than a good time. Um, <laughs> We have five beautiful daughters, five wonderful sons-in-laws, 13 grandchildren. One of them is safely in the arms of Jesus. Another one is going to be born in about a month or so. And so to say that we've been um, incredibly blessed would be a tremendous understatement. And so we are thanking God every single day for his goodness and his mercy and his love uh, in our lives. I have no greater joy, the Apostle John wrote, than to know that my children are walking in truth. And that's exactly what we praise God for. Um, Just by way of announcements, we have a number of uh, events going on in our church. We have Awanas, we have um, ladies' Bible studies, we have Romans on, uh, let's see, I wrote this stuff down. I think most of you know most of this stuff, but we're doing Wednesday night. Allie Richardson is teaching the book of Romans at 6.30. Laura Osnes on Tuesday mornings is teaching the book of Genesis. We have a men's breakfast, right, every other Saturday. If you haven't gotten your book, One Another, from Pastor Wayne, We're going to be going through the one another's, and uh, if you haven't gotten your book from him yet, um, please contact him and let him know, and uh, I think that's about it. Well, there was a couple, a man and his wife, who had been serving the Lord all their lives, and they sent their daughter to the mission field. She'd been gone for about three years. She was in Africa, deep recesses of the jungle, and she was coming home, and her parents were so excited again to see her after three years. They were going to meet her at the airport, and a couple months before, she had written to them, telling them that she was bringing home a certain special someone. She had met somebody uh, over there in Africa and was bringing him home, and she wanted to introduce him to her family. This was going to be her husband, future son-in-law, and everybody was very excited. Mom and dad got to the airport, and they were meandering around the halls and looking at all the people who were traveling and they were heading to the gate where he knew they knew that his daughter and this special someone were going to be getting off the plane. So as they got closer, he looked down the the hallway and he saw a man who looked a little bit unusual. He looked a little bit out of place. He was tall, dark, handsome. Uh, He had a long, flowing, flowery, colorful robe on and he had a staff in one hand and he was kind of dancing around, sort of left to right, kind of kind of chanting a little bit. He had his long hair in braids with different objects braided into his hair, and he had a kind of a, kind of a bone um, pierced through his nose and, and different piercings on his ears and uh, this long gold chain around his neck. And, and uh, as, the, as the dad kept looking, he noticed that uh, he was walking very close to his daughter. As a matter of fact, they were walking hand in hand. And all of a sudden, he realized the horror. This was the man she was bringing home. This was her, his future son-in-law. And finally, when they got close enough, his eyes met hers, and he said, No, sweetie, no. We told you we wanted you to marry a rich doctor. (laughs) So, things can oftentimes get very confusing. Uh, We need to make sure that we're very um, direct in what we want to communicate whenever we're communicating with people, especially when it comes to the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're in the book of Galatians. Um, Galatians was a town that Paul and Barnabas went to, or it was a Roman Roman province um, with different uh, cities there, Lystra, Iconium, Derbe. And Paul was there for a period of time preaching and teaching the good news of Jesus Christ. Many people were getting saved. Two of those were Timothy and Titus. These were young men who kind of became Paul's protégés. He took them under his wings. They became pastors, Timothy in Ephesus and Titus in an island of Crete. And uh, those are the letters to whom Paul wrote Timothy and Titus. The author of this letter is the Apostle Paul, and the recipients are these Galatian believers who are being being influenced by Judaizers. Paul went in, preached the gospel to the Gentiles. It was a gospel of salvation by grace through faith plus nothing. They didn't need to be circumcised. They didn't need to submit to the ceremonial law. They did not not need to submit to the Mosaic covenant. And these um, Judaizers came in and said, yes, you do. You do need to submit to circumcision, and you do need to um, be, uh, live, live under the principle of the Mosaic law in order for you to be saved. So Paul writes this letter to communicate to these people who are being influenced by these Judaizers 
that the whole goal and purpose for which Jesus Christ has saved us is to set us free, free from the power and the dominion of sin, free from legalism, free from law, so that we can walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. The theme of the book, of the letter, is Christian liberty, freedom in Christ. And the occasion of the letter is an attack on the Apostle Paul in three areas. The man, the ministry, and his message. As far as the man goes, they said that he was not one of the original apostles. He didn't know Jesus Christ after the flesh like the other apostles did. Consequently, he was not really called into a ministry um, as deeply and as committedly as they were. He was not personally called by Jesus Christ, is what they said. And then thirdly, as far as the message goes, he was not being true to Judaism. Well, Paul is going to answer that, and he's going to use the key word in this whole epistle is the word freedom, right? Um, The key verse would be Galatians 2.20, which Pastor Jesse will probably get to next week. Paul says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So it's no longer Paul, it's Jesus Christ living in and through him. Consequently, what we begin to see is that the most important thing that God wants to do in your life and mine is to begin to develop the character of Jesus Christ. Because a few chapters later, he's going to show what the fruit of the Spirit is, which is really a composite of the picture and the character and the nature of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Apart from these things, there is no law. Okay, So what he's saying now is that, um, well, let's just look at it this way. In the first two chapters, then, it's autobiographical. Paul is just talking about himself, his call to ministry, that it wasn't because of the apostles putting their stamp of approval on his life. Um, Sometimes people run around up here, and I think it's because a moving target is a little bit easier to hit. But I'm just going to stay right here and assume that uh, I'm not going to get hit with anything. So it's autobiographical. His ministry and his message come from whom? From God, from Jesus Christ himself. Then in chapters 3 and 4, see, the book of Galatians is one of the books that we really need to have just solidly, foundationally in our Christian life. Because in chapters 3 and 4, we're going to learn that salvation is by grace through faith plus what? Plus your resume, plus your ability to keep the law, plus this or plus that. I think it is a disaster if we, see, if we develop a, ring, a ladder with a bunch of rings that we have to climb up until finally we're in the very presence of God. No, Jesus Christ came to us. He came to suffer and to die. Salvation is by grace through faith in the Savior plus nothing. It's all about salvation. How do we get saved? How do we enter into a right relationship with God? And then chapters 5 and 6 is the next question. How do we get sanctified? How do we be made holy? How do we put on the image of the Lord Jesus Christ? And that too is by grace through faith. Salvation is by the Son, that's the Savior. Sanctification is by the Spirit. And so the contrast throughout this book is going to be between the flesh, to which legalism appeals, and the Spirit, which is now going to be conform- using, uh, God uses now the Holy Spirit in our lives to conform us to the image of Christ. And we begin to understand that. The the, uh, infinite possibilities open up before us as God conforms us to the image of his son and his character is developed in our lives and now we can become uh, those who proclaim the excellencies of him who has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light primarily because we know the change that God has worked in us. Not because we're obedient to the law but because the spirit of God has taken up personal, um, has taken up Uh, permanent residence within our lives so that now we can begin to live the Christian life. Remember, the Christian life is not difficult. It's impossible (laughs) to really live the Christian life the way that we find in the Bible. I mean, as soon as you get saved and you open up these pages, you begin to see there are things in here that there is no way that I can do these. And God says, exactly. And the motive is not then going to be to create rules, regulations, and a law so that now we can somehow be pleasing to God. No, it's God coming to you and saying, let me take over, transform your life, and conform you to a glorious image, which is Jesus Christ. And then, um, 
And then for all of eternity, we're going to be giving him praise and honor because of, what his, because of who and what he's done, not who and what we are or have done. See, when we get to heaven, we're not going to be standing around saying, wow, how'd you get here? Well, I gave a lot of money to the church. And I prayed four hours every day, and God said, good, come on in. Uh, boy, I led all these people to the Lord. I led this Sunday school class. I did this VBS. I did this Awana. No, we're all going to get there the same way by the grace of God and uh, working in our lives through the person of Jesus Christ. Now, one thing I want to go back and explain, because when you and I take a look at those kinds of truths, they seem to be sort of obvious to us, don't they? But if we can transform ourselves back about 2,000 years, it was anything but for the early church. Remember, the early church was composed exclusively of Jews. To see a Gentile walk into a Christian, or to walk into church in that day, was rare. And the Gospels are sort of challenging to read because what we're moving away from now is from law to grace. We're moving away from Judaism to Christianity. We're moving away from the law, or we're moving away from the temple, to the person of Jesus Christ who became flesh and tabernacled among us, and we beheld his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. For 1,500 years, Israel was a test case. God said, let's see how man can do under law. We'll put him under law for 1,500 years. How did they do? God, we love you, we'll obey you, we will not practice idolatry, we will not conform ourselves to the culture and to the Canaanite religions around us. No. But see, you and I on this side of the cross, and even further on this side of the uh, Reformation, these are truths that we take for granted, right? Like the man whose wife made him a marble cake and he took it for granted. See, we don't, <laughs> we don't want to do that. We don't want to take anything for granted. We want to say, God, these are things that you've done in our lives, but men have laid down their lives for centuries so that we, could, so that we can understand sola scriptura and sola gratia and sola fide and sola Christos and sola dea gloria, Impressed? <laughs> Me too. Okay, and what's more now, the Apostle Paul stands alone. Listen to this now. This is where we're going to go in this passage this morning. What, one thing that God wants us to learn to do is to stand alone. <clears throat> if we have to stand alone against culture, if we have to stand alone against the pervading philosophy of our day, if we have to stand alone against uh, immorality and homosexuality and, and liberalism and, and the denial of the deity of Christ and the denial of the... Uh, the, the inerrant word of God, are we, are we able to do it? Paul, in this situation, stood alone as the one minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ who clearly understands the priority and preeminence of grace. Let me repeat that. The apostle Paul stands alone, and I'll show you how that's true, as the one minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ who clearly understands the priority and preeminence of grace. Paul has been called the apostle of grace. And because he was such a legal, legalistic Pharisee, God had to transform his heart and his life. He went to seminary for three years in Arabia where the Lord Jesus Christ taught him personally and communicated the Old Testament to him. And he began to understand now some of the truths of Scripture like uh, Genesis 15, 6, where God said, Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Or Habakkuk 2, 4, um, as for the proud, his heart is not right within him, but the righteous man shall live by what? The righteous man shall live by faith. So, with that as our introduction, no extra charge for any of that, the message starts now. Let's stand, and we're going to read together Galatians. We're going to start in verse 1, and I got a little note here that says, slowly, so I'm going to slow down a little bit. It's kind of, kind of funny, there was a, a political speech and the, in the, um, <laughs> and the janitor found a copy of the speech and he was going over the politician's speech and at the end he had in big bold letters, uh, argument here very weak, talk loud, shout vehemently. Okay, so, so our, our, our argument here is not, is not weak, it's the very word of God. Let's pick it up in chapter 1 verse 18. Paul is giving an airtight um, alibi as to where his gospel came from and who called him into ministry. He says in verse 18, Then three years later, um, I went up to Jerusalem to become acquainted with Cephas, that's Peter, stayed with him 50 days, 15 days, and I did not see any of the other apostles except for James, 
the Lord's brother. Now, in what I am writing to you, I assure you before God that I am not lying. Then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and I was still unknown by sight to the churches of Judea, which were in Christ, but only they kept hearing, he who once persecuted us is now preaching the faith, which he once tried to destroy, and they were glorifying God because of me. Then, after an interval of 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along also. It was because of a revelation that I went up and submitted to them the gospel which I preach among the Gentiles. But I did so in private to those who were rep reputation for fear that I might be running or had run in vain. But not even Titus, who was with me, though he was a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. But it was because of the false brethren secretly brought in, who had sneaked in to spy out our liberty which we have in Christ to bring us into bondage. But we did not yield to them for even an hour so that the truth of the gospel would remain with you. But from those who were of reputation, what they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Well, those who were of reputation contributed nothing to me. But on the contrary, seeing that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been to the circumcised, for he who effectually worked for Peter in his apostleship to the circumcised effectually worked for me to the Gentiles, and recognizing the grace of God which had been given to me, James and Cephas and John, who were reputed to be pillars, gave to me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship so that we might go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. They only asked us to remember the poor, the very thing I was also eager to do. Father, we praise you. What a wonderful joy it is to be in the house of God, fellowshipping with the people of God, studying the word of God. Father, it is an amazing thing to us that you have communicated to us and condescended in language that we can comprehend and understand to tell us of your great and matchless and marvelous love that you have expressed to us. That love which was eternal within the Trinity has now been expressed through your Son to a world that certainly does not deserve it. But Father, in your grace, you have called us to yourself. You've called us out of darkness into your marvelous light. Your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, is the joy and the delight and the desire of our lives. He's the one that satisfies us. He's the one that changes and transforms us, saves us. It's because of him that our sins are forgiven and that we have an, a, an eternal home in heaven someday. Father, he is everything to us. We're here to worship him. We're here to exalt him. We want to get to know your son better so that we can be transformed into his image so that we can be effective as tools in your hand, proclaiming the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. All right, we having fun so far? Anybody, uh, you guys glad that you're here this morning? How many people are glad they're here this morning? How many people are glad they're not in prison somewhere? How many people will not raise their hands no matter what I ask? Okay. Um, <laughs> so, where's Paul been for the last 14 years? Well, one thing, he's been, um, he went back to Tarsus, that's where he was from, and then they saw this great outpouring of the Spirit of God, and people were getting saved in Antioch. So Barnabas goes and finds Saul, and he brings him back to Antioch, and there they teach the disciples for about a year. Then, Paul and Barnabas are called to a missionary journey. They go down to Cyprus, to Crete, um, and then they go up north to Galatia, to these cities of Lystra, Iconium, and Derbe. And the amazing thing is, is that Gentiles are getting saved. Gentiles are getting saved without converting to Judaism. How did, a, how did a Gentile in the Old Testament get saved? They had to align themselves with the God of Israel. They had to become converts, right? They were God-fearers. That was the first step. Then they become full-fledged converts so that now they um, are part of the Judaistic lifestyle, whether it was uh, Ruth or Rahab or other people that Jesus talked about, for instance, in Luke 4. Since the call of Abraham, though, Gentiles were saved based upon their treatment and their relationship with Israel. But now, he says, after an interval of 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along also. Gentiles are getting saved. There is an outpouring of the Spirit of God, and they are getting saved in droves. And then, right, as we've said, on, their, on Paul's heels as he left, these Judaizers came and wanted to put them back under law, back under uh, a legalistic lifestyle. He doesn't need to introduce who Barnabas and Titus are because they know who they, these men are. Barnabas was with Paul 
on his missionary journey when he shared the gospel in Galatia. And Titus was probably a Galatian. He probably got saved during the ministry and preaching of the Apostle Paul. But notice what it says here now in verse 2. It was because of a revelation that I went up. In other words, the apostles who are in Jerusalem, they didn't call me on the carpet. They didn't say, hey, Paul, get up here and explain to us what in the world you're doing. It was by a revelation that I went up. And hold your hand or hold your finger here in Galatians uh, 2 and look over in Acts chapter 15 because I think the two um, situations are the same. Acts chapter 15 was the council in Jerusalem. And let's just take a look at a few verses here. Um, it says that in verse 1, some men came down from Judea and began teaching the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Now this has been true throughout the whole church history. It's good that you've put your faith in Jesus Christ, but here's all the things that you need to add in order to make sure you're really saved. And then verse 5, some of the sect of the Pharisees who had believed stood up saying, it is necessary to circumcise them and to direct them to observe the law of Moses. If we look back at verse 2, we see where this, um, this uh, revelation probably came from. When Paul and Barnabas had great dissension and debate with them, that's with the Judaizers, the brethren determined that Paul and Barnabas and some others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders concerning this matter. What matter? The matter was, um, do Gentiles need to be circumcised? As they were circumcised, they were putting themselves under the law of Moses. They were putting themselves under this legalistic system, and that's what they are going to try to decide if that's necessary. So back in Galatians, verse 2, I went up and submitted to them the gospel which I preach among the Gentiles. I preach is in the present tense. What he's saying here is that this is the gospel I preached on my missionary journey. This is the gospel which I'm preaching now. It hasn't changed. You see, you and I um, are witnesses. We have been given a message. We don't need to come up with a message. We don't need to change it, alter it, modify it, or make it more palatable to a culture who hates God and has rejected him. We have the good old story of Jesus and his love, right? Paul, when he went to Corinth, Corinth said, I determined to know nothing among you except, except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And it's good to know that Paul said that I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. Why? Because the Corinthians could be mean, <laughs> immoral, ungodly. I mean, we think we have it bad in our community and in our world. It was far worse back there in the first century A.D. where Paul was ministering. But Jesus said to his disciples, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and none of the uttermost parts of the earth. Well, we don't need a new message. What we need is the power to proclaim that message that we have already been given. We are witnesses. We're not philosophers. We're not debaters. We're not the intellectual elite of our day. We're not a bunch of Pi bi, bi, bi bi Beta Kappas who sit around with intelligences of over 130 or 150 uh, IQs reasoning and pondering who God is and how people are made right with him. No, we've been given a message that we need to proclaim to the whole world, and all we need is the filling of the Holy Spirit and the moral courage to take our stand with Jesus Christ and proclaim that message to a world that is dying and on its way to hell. In fact, it's dead and needs to be revived. And the only thing that can revive it is the good news of Jesus Christ. And so what do we proclaim? His virgin birth, his virtuous life, his um, vicarious death, his victorious resurrection, and his visible return. <laughs> that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. He's coming back to judge the living and the dead. You believe that? And every man and woman will be assigned to their eternal destiny either in heaven or in hell. We don't put our finger into the wind and discover the prevailing attitude of the culture and then trim our sails to fall in line with it. Christians have never been friends with the world. <laughs> We've always been persecuted by the world. And what's going to happen if that persecution starts? Sue and I were talking last night. It doesn't sound like fun. But here's Jesus' promise. Blessed are those who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What we need is a moral courage and the filling of the Holy Spirit not to, not to trim our sails to the prevailing ideas of our culture and then trim them to fall in line. No, we are tethered to God by his word. This is our North Star. This is our guiding principle. This is what we lean upon, and this is the very foundation of our lives. Uh, for the it's, it's the final word for faith and practice. Faith, what we believe, so that we're orthodox, 
practice or the praxi so that we're right in how we practice and how we live. This is the book that teaches us who God is and what he expects for us to do. And uh, we will, um, he, he, the word of God is that which will continually guard our lives for the glory of God as we seek to be obedient to him. That's what Paul is saying here. I submitted the gospel that I preached to the Gentiles. I, I don't need to modify it. I don't need to alter it. There, there, there's really nothing about the gospel that, that is ever going to be palatable to somebody who has rejected God and wants to have nothing to do with him. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God, right? To the, to the Jew, it's foolishness. To the Gentiles, it's the power of, uh, it's, it's, uh, it, it's the weakness of God. But to you and I who are being saved, it is the power of God. Being saved, that's interesting. I thought we were saved. We'll come to that in a minute. Okay, so this is a revelation. By revelation, um, Paul and Barnabas and Titus went to uh, Jerusalem. The gospel he preaches, he says, you will receive power. We don't need this new message. Um, Charles Spurgeon one time, the great Metropolitan Tabernacle preacher there in England, he was once asked, what is the secret to the power of your ministry? And he said, I explain the passage, and then I make a beeline for the cross. <laughs> it's the cross that gives power to our message. I mean, you can talk about God. You know what Francis Schaeffer said? He said, in our world, the, the, the word D-O-G has a lot, more, um, lot clearer meaning than the word G-O-D does. And it's because people come up with all kinds of ideas about who God is. In fact, you can just create your own God, and that's kind of the world that we live in. It's called pluralism. It's called existentialism. It's called whatever it is that you want to do and whatever it is that you want to be, just, just, uh, just create a God that you can serve and become that person. I mean, God is in all of us anyway, right? Well, that's certainly not the truth. Because if we go to the cross, we find two things. We find the infinite holiness of God and the total depravity of of man. We find a God who, uh, who the only one, Jesus Christ, who can take the hand of a, of a holy God and the hand of a helpless sinner and reconcile them and bring them back into fellowship is Jesus Christ. And he did it 2,000 years ago at the cross of Calvary. That's our message. That's what we proclaim. That's the foundation of our lives. Paul said, for I received, for I delivered to you what I also received. How Jesus Christ died that's an historical fact. For our sins, that's the theological truth according to the scriptures. And he was dead. And he was raised again on the third day according to the scriptures. If that message isn't palatable enough, what other message do we have? Somebody was once asked, how do I evangelize a Catholic? Try the gospel. <laughs> how do I evangelize a Mormon or a, or a Buddhist or, a, or somebody in Islam? The gospel of Jesus Christ is good enough. <laughs> if that doesn't do the trick, then, then we have no other message. Um, Josh McDowell was once debating a, a person in, in Islam on one of the uh, U.S. campuses, and the, and the young man said, you guys are trying, you Christians are trying to get to, the, to, to heaven on the back of a crucified man. Amen. It's just that that man is a little bit more than a man. He's the God-man. He's personal, he's infinite, and he's eternal. And he's co-equal with God, and he's co-eternal, and he's omniscient, and he's omnipotent, and he's infinite in his love, holiness, majesty, and grace. So here we have now, notice something that really comes up here that's really rather interesting. He's going to refer to these apostles, these leaders in the church of Jerusalem, kind of in a veiled way. Four times he's going to say, those who were of reputation. Those who were of reputation. Those who were of high reputation. Those who were of reputation. Is that four? I think that's about four. Um, there's three kinds of people in this world. Those who can count, those who can't. Um, but I think that's four. So um, I'll let that settle in for just a minute. Okay, let's go. But I did so in private to those who were of reputation for fear that I might be running or had run in vain. Keep that in the back of your mind. Now, Paul is not saying, gosh, I better get up there and communicate to them the gospel that I've been preaching because I wonder if I'm wrong. Maybe I've been wrong this whole time. That's not, he said, when, when the risen Lord Jesus Christ appears to you on the road to Damascus, teaches you for three years in Arabia, you can be pretty sure that your message is right on. What he's saying here is I needed to get to Jerusalem and make sure that these guys aren't aligning themselves with the Judaizers and saying, yeah, Gentiles need to put themselves under the yoke of the Mosaic law. That's what he's saying. If they're saying that, I'm in trouble. 
because these all, all and not not his message, um, but, but but the people to whom he has declared his message to, who understand the liberty that we have in Jesus Christ. Right? I mean, if somebody walked in here and said, "Okay, everybody, uh, circumcision, submit yourself to the law," we would say, "Ah." Uh, now watch this, but not even Titus, who was with me, though he was a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. By whom? It appears that these Judaizers went to, <clears throat> went to Jerusalem and were exerting a great deal of influence on the leaders and Titus. But Titus simply said, <laughs> no way. I'm not getting circumcised. I'm not going through that because I don't need to. Um, as a Gentile, he knows what has happened to him. He knows that he's a changed man. You remember the moment that you got saved? Did you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? Was everything a little bit different? Did you understand who God was and his love for you? I mean, there are all kinds of things we didn't understand. There, there are all kinds of areas that we need to grow in the grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ, but, but we knew that something had happened, that our sins were forgiven, that God was our heavenly Father, that heaven was our eternal home, that Jesus Christ was our personal Savior. Nobody had to convince us of that because it was the Spirit of God who was communicating that truth to your heart and into your life. And Titus understood that, right? And so he would say, uh, cutting away of the, some flesh, what is that going to do? Well, it was a symbol of putting themselves under the Mosaic Covenant, but, but, but um, Titus is saying, I don't need to add anything to this. So Paul would say, well, go ahead and share your testimony. And he would say with William Newell, years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me he died at Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. Why? Because there's a man there on a cross <laughs> and he's drawing all men to himself. Not through the law, not through legalism, but by grace through faith plus nothing. So that's what Jesus Christ was doing. Let's take a deep breath and enjoy ourselves. Okay, here we go again. Now, verse 4. But it was because of these false brethren secretly brought in who had sneaked in to spy out our liberty. This was a, this was a military coup. This was a military crisis. These guys are subversives. This was a corrupt operation that's underway to take us prisoner. It was for freedom that Christ set us free, Paul's going to say. Therefore, do not be subject to a yoke of slavery again. Uh, because here, here's the question. Once we're saved by grace through faith, what is the motive that's going to allow us to pursue a holy and a righteous lifestyle that's pleasing to God? Well, you only have two choices. You either have the law which is up to you, and good luck. Or you have the Spirit of God who is infinite in his power, omniscient, omnipotent. He's communicating to us the truth of God which transforms our lives and makes us what? If he's the Holy Spirit, he's going to make us holy, holy. Can the law do that? Can the law do anything good? It wasn't, and remember, it wasn't the problem with the law. The law is an expression of the very heart, character, and mind of God. The law wasn't the problem. It was the material that the, that the law had to work with. That's you, and that's me. We're totally depraved. We're sinners. We're alienated from God. We're enemies of God. You can't take something like a law and bring it down into, into, in, into the human realm and, and expect it to exert power to transform a life. You see, when Jesus Christ died, he not only died to free us from the penalty of sin, but from the power of sin as well, right? Okay, so only Jesus Christ can do this. It's not, remember Paul cried out, and this is really a cry of victory, wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death? You ever felt that way? If you're a Christian and you're reading your Bible and you see what you ought to be, but you see what you are and how far it is to where you want to go, you cry that, you cry out. But notice what Paul said. He didn't say, what will set me free? It's who. Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death? Here's the victory. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. What is it that's enslaving you right now? Where is the bondage of sin? How, remember, God came to uh, Cain and he said, why is your countenance fallen? Why are you angry? If you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? But if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door and its desire is for you. But you 
must master it. One of the things about people like Titus and Timothy and Epaphroditus and the people that worked so closely with the Apostle Paul, these were men that Paul looked at and said, I don't need to light a fire under these guys. They've heard the gospel and they want to serve God and they want to know the word and they want to preach it and they want to teach it. And, they, and Paul would say, come on, come with me. Let me put my arm around you and disciple you. We're off to the races. You see, people who understand that, the power of God, that they've, they've been set free from sin, they're, they're, there's no legalism in their life. Because what does legalism bring? It brings frustration. It brings a critical spirit, right? Because if I'm legalistic, I have to be better than you. And if you're better than me, I'm going to find out a way to put you down so I can feel good about myself. We begin to complain. Chuck Swindoll said, here is the definition of legalism. The awful fear that somebody somewhere is having fun. <laughs> hey, is it okay as Christians to have fun? Can we laugh? Can we joke around? Can we have a good time? I don't think there's anybody on the planet that ought to enjoy life more than the child of God. We're, we're experiencing love, joy, peace, all those things. Now I'm going to get right now to the favorite part. I've been looking forward to this for millenniums. Look at verse 5 now. But we did not yield in subjection to them for even an hour so that the truth of the gospel would remain with you. You know, first of all, Acts chapter 9, when Paul got saved, that wasn't the first time he heard the gospel. I just sort of discovered that recently, so that may be new to you too. But when the church has hills that it's willing to die on, the church is safe. You should be praying for your leaders in this church, the pastors, the elders, the deacons, that there are hills that they are willing to die on as they protect your souls and watch out for, your, for the goodness of your soul. Things like the inerrancy of Scripture, right? The deity of Christ, the substitutionary atonement, salvation by grace through faith, the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ, the second coming of Jesus Christ to judge the living and the dead and to establish his kingdom. A real heaven and a real hell. These are things that we take our stand on. And I want to show you where Paul kind of got this motivation. Turn back to Acts chapter 7. You ever think about um, going to heaven, and obviously heaven is going to be such a wonderful place because of the fact that Jesus Christ is there, right? The most wonderful person in all the universe. He's fully God, but he's different because he's fully man. He's fully man, but he's different because he's fully God. Um, we'll, we'll spend eternity pondering the person of Christ. That's pretty much what heaven, I mean, it's going to be a lot more, but, but that's going to be primarily it. But after I've done, pondered that for like maybe seven or 8,000 years, there, there are certain people that I want to get together with. The first one is Luke. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take Luke and get him aside and, take, and buy him a nice Starbucks, you know, whatever he wants, like a, like a um, latte, you know, half, half, half grand, grande, half calf, soy latte, whatever he wants. I want to talk to him about uh, how did you come up with that gospel? which has been called the most beautiful piece of literature ever written. I mean, every time you open that book, you just fall in love with the Savior and his ability to do what he did. But the second person I want to have a little talk with is Stephen. I think of all the people in Scripture, Stephen is my hero. Stephen was a deacon, um, but he was saturated with the Word of God. I mean, his mind and his heart were just saturated with Scripture. Um, Rich Mullins uh, wrote a song about the importance of the Word of God, and he said, stories like that make a boy grow bold. Stories like that make a man walk straight. That's what the Word of God is intended to do. Stephen was in front of the Sanhedrin. Okay? These guys aren't too friendly to Christianity. They're the ones who condemned Jesus to death. They're the ones who have told the apostles to stop preaching in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And now we have Stephen giving a defense before them. And the problem is, is that they say that Stephen has been teaching against the law and against God, against Moses, represents the law, and God, the temple, right? And Stephen is saying things like, you know, Jesus Christ has fulfilled and superseded these things. We're not under law anymore, and the temple is not the place where we need to go to to worship God. Who is our temple? Jesus Christ, right? And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Well, in the first 50 verses of chapter 7, off the top of his head, Stephen gives an exact account of the history of Israel, going all the way back to the call of Abraham. And he said, God appeared to Abraham in Mesopotamia, not Jerusalem. 
And then he goes on to say that God um, appeared to, to, jo- to Joseph in Egypt. Then he goes on to say that God appeared to Moses on the backside of the desert at the burning bush. Why are we placing such an emphasis on the temple? But then notice what happens. I also want to say, I have no idea when I'm supposed to be done. <laughs> I also want to say, advert, let, let's pick it up in chapter 7, verse 48. However, he says, the Most High does not dwell in houses made by human hands, as the prophet said. Heaven is my throne and earth is the footstool of my feet. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord, or what place is there for my repose? Was it not my hand which made all these things? Now, it's true that we can go and worship God anywhere. But God has called us as a community to come here on Sunday mornings and worship him as a community. But then he begins to go, and in just three verses, he explains the law. And watch how seeker-sensitive Stephen is. Watch how seeker-friendly he is. I'm kidding. Notice what he says. You men who are stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears are always resisting the Holy Spirit. In Greek, it's even more, it's even more powerful. It says, you, the Holy Spirit, are always resisting. You're not just resisting the apostles. You're not just resisting me. You're resisting God. And so he says here, you are always resisting the Holy One. You are doing just as your fathers did. Which one of the prophets did your fathers not pure persecute? They killed those who had previously announced the coming of the righteous one, whose betrayers and murderers you have now become. You who received the laws ordained by angels and yet did not keep it. You know what he's saying? You guys desperately need grace. He's not just giving a defense of, um, of, uh, of the fact that Jesus Christ has fulfilled the temple and Jesus Christ has fulfilled the law and those things are now set aside and our worship now is directed toward Jesus. He's saying, here's the gospel. You guys are in a world of hurt. If you continue down the road that you're going, you're going to a place where you do not want to go. But they didn't want to hear that. Look at verse 54. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the quick and they began gnashing at them. They turned into animals and they're just foaming at the mouth and they're grinding their teeth. They, 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 they need a uh, night guard, but, uh, but, but they don't want one. And so they're gnashing at them with their teeth. But being full of the Holy Spirit, he gazed intently into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Now, I think Stephen knows that his life is over. He knows that this is the testimony, and he's, wi- he's, he's, he's a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ as far as the gospel is, and he knows his life is over. And in the corner of his eye, who does he see? He sees Saul of Tarsus. And the interesting thing is, is that this, this is how Luke introduces Saul of Tarsus into the story. It's phenomenal. It's, it's, it's almost magical. It's like um, this man uh, is at the very center of the persecution, and yet watch what happens in chapter 9. Behold, I see the heavens opened up and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Verse 55, standing at the right hand of God. There's some question as to why Jesus is standing, right? He's supposed to be sitting. He went up, he ascended into heaven, session. He's seated at the right hand of God. Psalm 110, verse 1, God says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make thine enemies a footstool for thy feet. But here Jesus Christ stands up. Why? He's welcoming the first martyr of the Christian church into glory. Now, this is not the first Christian who has died in the church age. That was Ananias and Sapphira. But when you lie to the Holy Spirit and you deceive the the apostles into believing something that's not true, you don't get a ticket tape parade when you go into glory. They sneak you in the back door. Not so with Stephen. Stephen is making a bold, glorious declaration on behalf of the gospel of Jesus Christ. They cried out with a loud voice, covered their ears, and rushed at him with one impulse. Boy, this is mature. When they had driven him out of the city, they began stoning him, and the witnesses laid aside their robes at the feet of a young man named Saul. And you know what? Saul never forgot this. This vision that he has here of the message of Stephen and watching him being stoned and how how peacefully and calmly and sedately he goes into glory, never left the Apostle Paul. In fact, This message that he's just heard in Acts chapter 9, I don't think Paul will ever preach a sermon. I don't think he'll ever teach a Sunday school. I don't think he'll ever write an epistle. But that this story of Stephen is on the front burner of his mind. This is where Paul first heard the gospel. Where did you first hear it? In fact, when he's given his uh, testimony in chapter 22, he says, I watched as they stoned Stephen. That's why little grandkids, come up here, sweetie. Um... (laughs) Boy, I got to babysit some of my grandkids yesterday. Spoil city. 
hot chocolate with whipped cream, pancakes with whipped cream, suckers, oh my gosh. I felt bad for the mom, when, I mean my daughter, when she came and got the kids. Anyway, that's what grand pops do. They went on stoning Stephen as he called on the Lord and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit, and then falling on his knees, he cried out with, with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Having said this, he fell asleep. It's just like a father or a mother holding their little infant, rubbing their hair and speaking soothing words to them and saying, it's okay. You're in mommy's arms. You're in daddy's arms. Be still, be quiet, be calm. You're in the arms of your heavenly father. See, Christian, you don't have to stay alive, but you do have to remain faithful. Jesus Christ made the good confession for you before Pontius Pilate. That's varsity. That's captain of the football team right there. He sees the Roman lictor with the cat of nine tails. He, he, he sees the cross that he's going to be nailed to. And he says, bring it on. Because that's the will of my father for my life. So that I might bring many sons to glory. And by the way, you know when Jesus did not carry his own cross, another man had to? You know what that was demonstrating? When Roman law said you're going to be crucified, you carried your cross because it was a symbol that you were under the authority of Rome. Jesus wasn't going to the cross because he was under the authority of Rome. Somebody else carried his cross. He, go, he went because he was under the authority of God. And so are you. And so am I. God is the one we serve. We don't serve culture. We don't serve the, we don't serve the prevailing philosophies of our age. We don't serve psychology. We don't serve science. We don't serve anything else that culture might throw at us. We are longing to fall into the hands of God. Why? Because to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Now, we're going to finish up here and and the message is here now. Watch what happens. Okay, so we did not yield in subjection to them for even an hour. Christian, you don't have to subject yourselves to anybody but God through his word, okay? You, let, you, you, you commit yourself to God in obedience to his word and let the chips fall where they may. Now he says, but from those who were of high reputation, what they were in the flesh with Jesus, okay, so they were lived with Jesus for three years, doesn't matter, makes no, does it, no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Those who are of reputation contributed nothing to me. Why that veiled statement, those who are of reputation? But on the contrary, seeing that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been to the circumcised, for he who effectually worked for Peter and his apostleship to the circumcised effectually worked for me to the Gentiles, and recognizing the grace that had been given to me. How do you see grace operating in a body of believers? Two things, the great commission and the great commandment. Jesus said, all authority has been given to me, in heaven and on earth, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them, that's evangelism, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them, that's discipleship, all that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you, even to the end of the age. That's what we're about. Missionaries, sharing the gospel, communicating the truth of Jesus Christ to those who have never heard. And then the second thing is the great commandment, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, that all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Those two things manifest the grace of God. Can you see it? I see it. I see people getting saved, baptized, and this community of believers that we are a part of, that you're a part of, that I'm a part of, there is love flowing from the impersonal, infinite, eternal trinity into our lives and then into the lives of one another. And so Paul goes on to say here now, recognizing the grace that has been given to me, now he finally comes out and says their names, James and Cephas and John, who were reputed to be pillars. So the fourth time he does this, reputed. And you know what Paul is saying? He's saying, you know, um, I know that these guys are important. They're leaders in the church. They're important. They're pillars in the church. There's like a crescendo. It starts with leaders. He says they're very important, and they're pillars. But you know what Paul is saying? In a time of crisis, they really didn't step up like they should have. 
I think that these guys are being very influenced by the Judaizers. And I think that they came to pay Paul, and I think that they came to t- Titus. And they said, uh, you know, what's the big deal? We're trying to minister to Jews. We don't want to put a stumbling block in their way. So why don't you guys just go ahead and get circumcised? And Paul said, absolutely not. We're under grace. Grace, we're not, you know what that means? That means we're going to put ourselves under the Mosaic law. We're not going to do that. Paul is walking a very fine line here because he's dealing with, he's dealing with, with these guys, you know? I mean, he's dealing with James and Cephas and John, these, these apostles, these pillars, and he's saying, I have the highest respect and the highest admiration for them. But what Paul is saying, we're going to see it again next week because Paul's going to bring up another issue during Peter's life where Peter didn't... Um, perform remarkably well either. What a certain religious system does with this that says that Peter was impeccable, <laughs> that he was the first pope, that he was uh, that kind of thing is anybody's guess. But here Paul is saying, um, it pretty much landed on me, Paul is saying. And so we can be very thankful that, um, that Paul took a stand like he did and, um, and that's the kind of stand that you and I sometimes are called to make, regardless of what people around us might be doing or not doing. Your responsibility is to obey God. Early in his monastic career, Martin Luther, rummaging through the stacks of a library, happened upon a volume of sermons by John Huss, the Bohemian who had been condemned as a heretic. I was overwhelmed with astonishment, Luther wrote. I could not understand for what cause they had burnt so great a man who explained the scriptures with so much skill. There's a man who teaches at um, Dallas Theological Seminary. His name's John Hanna. We've had the privilege of hearing him on a number of times. And he was speaking about revival. And he said, Luther in his day, and he was just repeating a lot of the things that John Huss had talked about 100 years earlier in Czechoslovakia, who was repeating a lot of things that John Wycliffe, the morning star of the Reformation, spoke 200 years before, 200 years, 200 years before Martin Luther in England. He was saying that God alone was authoritative, and that grace was obtained by taking communion and, and, and the, not, not the sacraments, but through faith in Jesus Christ. And the priesthood was meant to be servants, not to be wealthy and profit, profiteers of the church. Same thing was said by John Huss 100 years earlier. They killed him. Same thing was said 200 years before by John Wycliffe in England. He died before they had a chance to kill him, so they exhumed his bones and burnt them at the stake. But these men all said the same thing, and they were, going, they were going against the tide. They were spitting in the wind. But you know what, John, what Dr. Hannah said? All of a sudden, in Martin Luther's day, the wind changed. The same message had been proclaimed for 200 years. But now, all of a sudden, people stood up and took note and said, that's the direction that we want to go. And the Reformation was on. In Luther's day, the wind changed, and that's what revival is. That's what Reformation is, when the winds of God, when when God changes the wind. So what do you do? You keep spitting in the wind. I can remember to this day sitting just a few years after I got saved with my my, my dad and my uncle, who's 12 years younger than my dad. My uncle was just sitting there listening. Yeah, this is interesting. This is wonderful. And my dad was so violently opposed to the gospel. Now he looks back and says, what in the world was I doing? But I shared with him over and over and over the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then all of a sudden, about 12 years ago, the winds changed. And he went and talked to the pastor of our church. And he said, I want that. He said, would you like to pray with me right now to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? And he said, no, I'd like to do that with my son. So we were having a dinner, and he came over, and I said, Dad, let's go talk. And so I shared the gospel with him. You believe this? Yeah, you believe you're a sinner? Yeah, I know I'm a sinner. You believe that Jesus Christ died to pay the penalty for sin? Yes, I believe that. You want to trust him as your personal savior, invite him into your life so that he can be Lord and savior of your life? Yeah, I want to do that. So we prayed. And there might be somebody in here where uh, people have been talking to you about the gospel for for a long time. Uh, Maybe today is the day that the winds change and you begin to understand and to comprehend the love that God has for you that's been manifested through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who went to the cross to take your place. He's your substitute. Oh my gosh, playing basketball when a substitute came in for me, I hated that. I love this substitute. (laughs) I love this one who went to the cross for me. I should have been crucified. I should have suffered and died. I should have hung on the cross in disgrace. But Jesus, God's son, took my place. And he took your place too. 
If you don't know the joy of, uh, of salvation yet, you need to pray and ask God to come into your life, forgive you for your sin. Make Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior. Do it today. Let's pray. Father, we praise you and thank you so much for your word. We thank you so much for, for the delight that we have in your son. Father, there's no one like him. There is no one, Father, who even comes close to the majesty and the glory and the wonder and the, and the love that he has for us. Thank you, Father, for your work in our lives. We pray that you would give us the boldness and the strength, the filling of your Holy Spirit to be witnesses of Jesus Christ. Let us just proclaim that old, old story of Jesus and his love. We thank you, Father, and praise you and pray in Jesus' name. Amen.